Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us at the Economic Research Council. A very warm welcome to today's session. It's a real privilege to introduce Professor Jonathan Portis, and we're really glad that he could join us today. Um, I know he had the opportunity to have some other potentially interesting engagements, but we're very happy he's, he's here with us today. Um, if you are not aware, Jonathan is a Professor of Economics and Public Policy at King's College London and a senior fellow at the UK and a Changing Europe Initiative. Um, he's previously served as the Chief Economist at the Department for Work and Pensions, as well as the Cabinet Office. Um, Jonathan will begin by presenting for roughly 30 minutes, and then we'll have roughly 30 minutes of Q&A after that. And we strongly encourage you to engage actively, so please do submit any of your questions via the Q&A function, function sorry, at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so it's with great anticipation that I welcome Jonathan to share his valuable insights. Over to you, Jonathan. Um, thanks very much, David, and uh, um, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, so, uh, as David said, I was a, a civil servant for a very long time. I'm now a, an academic, um, but for much of the last 25 years in and out of government, I've been particularly interested in the topic of immigration. Uh, and uh, it's always been interesting, but I have to say the last couple of years have perhaps been um, the most interesting part of that um, because of the sort of quite unprecedented developments, uh, unprecedented, unexpected uh, developments in UK immigration over the last few years, um, resulting in part, although not exclusively from Brexit, other, other things as well. Um, but I'm going to try and describe what's happened uh, where we think we are now and speculate a bit about what might happen or perhaps indeed what should happen um, next. Uh, so quite a lot to cover and I'm going to be covering you know, you know the material that that's contained in several of, of my papers, um, all of which of course you can find easily enough uh, should you want to read any more about this. So um, briefly, you know, I'll start with the Brexit referendum, since that is a, a sort of obvious turning point politically, psychologically, and also, as it turns out, um, in the data. Um, because beginning, you know, immediately um, after the referendum um, in 2016, migration from the European Union um, fell and that, uh, um, you know, even though nothing changed in UK law or policy for a number of years, because of course, Brexit itself didn't happen uh, for quite some time. But nonetheless, uh, the psychological impact, political impact of the referendum was such that EU migration fell very sharply. Um, and that fall continued, as we'll see. Um, immigration, however, from outside the European Union for, for work and study, uh, but increased um, even again, beginning in 2016, really, and going up to the pandemic. Um, but then after the pandemic, as, as we'll discuss shortly, um, at a much more accelerated rate. Um, also, since the pandemic, we've had um, increased flows of people coming here, um, either with refugee status or seeking refugee status. So people from um, under the Hong Kong special visa, people from Ukraine and irregular arrivals on small boats. Um, where does that leave us? Well, you know, forecasts for future immigration are, are very, very uncertain for reasons which I'll come on to, but currently at levels of, of perhaps 250 to 350,000, which is still historically very high. But the dramatic nature of the, the changes um, can be seen um, here. Um, so um, if you uh, um, look at what, what's how there's a lot going on on this graph. Many of you will probably have seen versions of it before because uh, 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 um, uh, highlighting the last couple of years. But just look at, at what's happened since the referendum. You can see that, that uh, um, migration from the EU, the light blue line, actually peaked literally in the month of the referendum at about 300,000 and has been falling steadily ever since. Uh, um, you know, even before uh, Brexit, before the pandemic, and then since then, and now is um, on current estimates is actually negative. In other words, more people are more people of European origin are leaving um, than are than are arriving. Um, meanwhile, at the same time, 
um, migration from outside the EU had been r r running at uh, um, fairly s steady levels of uh, 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 about uh, um, a little under 100,000 a year in the run up to the referendum, then began growing again uh, um, shortly after the referendum and grew up till the pandemic. Unsurprisingly, of course, it pretty much stopped during the pandemic uh, um, uh, for obvious reasons. But then after the pandemic has um, shot up um, to uh, um, extremely high levels in the last couple of years. So we have over the last couple of years, uh, um, we have uh, uh, immigration, total immigration. That's the uh, light blue line of, of you know, about 700,000 a year, um, and net migration from outside the EU, um, even higher because net migration of everyone else is negative, of about 800,000 a year. Um, and those levels are, are really um, quite without parallel in the history of migration to the UK. Uh, um, you know, uh, as far back as records began, and almost certainly long, long before records ever began, those numbers, I mean, even if you view them as a percentage of the population, let alone in absolute terms, are really um, quite extraordinarily high. Um, and while they will, as I say, uh, uh, as I'm going to say, will almost certainly fall back quite a lot in the next few years, um, it's likely to remain, I think, reasonably high for, for the foreseeable future. Um, so why did that occur? Well, um, one key reason, of course, was the post-Brexit immigration system. Um, what did the post-Brexit immigration system do? Um, it ended free movement. Uh, uh, um, so, and of course, that was what, what, and it's worth remembering what Vote Leave promised us um, in the Brexit referendum. They did not promise to reduce net migration. They may have hinted very strongly at it. They may have nudged and winked a lot. Um, and many of their voters may have believed that net migration, the migration was going to come down a lot. But that's not what they said they were going to do. What they said they were going to do was to abolish free movement and introduce a new system that treated everybody equally uh, wherever they came from. Um, and did and and prioritized people on the basis of uh, um, uh, 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 of, of what the country needed, by which they meant skills or and and or salary. Um, and um, in sharp contrast, you may think to a number of other promises that the Leave campaign made. Um, broadly, this is exactly what was delivered: free movement ended, and a new skilled work visa was uh, um, introduced that applied broadly to all nationalities um, on the same basis. So uh, um, basically, what, you know, whether you can qualify for a work visa to this country, it doesn't matter whether you come from India or Italy, Bangladesh or Belgium, um, the rules are essentially the same. There is a salary threshold, there is a skills threshold, there are a bunch of rules around the edges for that, but that's broadly how it's supposed to work. There's no cap, no quota, um, and the skill and salary threshold are set considerably below the level at which they applied um, before the new system was brought in. In other words, before uh, um, to the, the way that uh, people coming from outside Europe had to qualify before 2021. In addition to other big changes, um, there was a new graduate visa, essentially a reinvention of a visa we had for a brief period in the late 2000s, um, which allowed people coming here to study, to stay on for two years and work in any job they wanted. So if you graduate from a UK university, um, or if you, have an in if you get a visa here to come as an international student, you graduate from a, a UK university, you can then apply to stay on for two more years and work in any job. Um, the second addition they made, which actually came in somewhat later than the new system, was to waive essentially the skill and salary thresholds for people working in the social care sector. So you don't need to be have any particular skill level or to earn any particular salary um, for if you get a job in social care, um, you can uh, you, you you anybody can come pretty much uh, 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 subject to language requirements and paying the fees and all the rest of it. But uh, but there is no other bar. Um, and the impact is that um, at least until 
the most recent changes, um, that meant that about half the jobs in the whole economy, perhaps more, were open in principle to people coming from anywhere in the world. That is to say, you, an employer, could for those jobs, for, for those jobs, hire anybody. And if you and or the employee were willing to pay the various fees and fill in the various forms, um, that person could come. Um, and that gave us one of the most liberal systems for any um, advanced economy, as, our, as I can tell, um, certainly at least comparable to the big countries, the sort of big Anglo-Saxon Commonwealth countries of immigration, uh, um, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, um, all of which have had relatively high migration rates um, in uh, um, over the last couple of decades. Um, so what can we say about this? Well, uh, um, here are a you know, list of my recent papers on this, um, all of which you can find online. So I will skip over that, but just to give you the idea that um, in, in the graphs and charts that I'm presenting, there is actually some uh, analysis and, and research that, that lies behind it. Um, so um, here you can see what that has done to visas. So these are, this is, long-term visa issuance. This is, that is to say, for people who are seeking to come to the UK on a long-term basis, um, which typically means at least six months, um, how, uh, uh, um, what, what has happened to that visa issuance. And here you can see pretty steady levels of, you know, quite, quite consistent um, year to year um, up until um, the pandemic a very sharp drop during the pandemic for you know, obvious reasons. And then since then, a very, very sharp rise. Um, and the two, uh, the two biggest categories by far are study, that's the green line, where you can see there was a sort of gradual rise um, between 2012, 2013 and, to, and the pandemic. Um, but then a considerably sharper one, um, not just a recovery to pre-pandemic levels, but a rise above the previous trend um, after the uh, uh, pandemic. Um, and that uh, is largely driven by the attractiveness, a combination of factors, I guess, the attractiveness of the graduate visa to um, people from some countries, combined with um, the uh, intensifying financial squeeze on universities, which given that universities now make a loss on British students, that is to say, tuition fees have been eroded by inflation to the point where um, we uh, have to subsidize, you know, we can't uh, 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 you know, uh, finance the provision out of the fees themselves, they have to be cross subsidized. Where does that cross subsidy come from? In significant part, it comes from international students. So in order to maintain the financial model of the universities, um, the government and the universities have been uh, trying to increase the number of international students. And that is indeed precisely what happened. Um, but an even sharper rise in people coming to, uh, to work. Um, and that is driven both by the relatively liberal nature of the new visa system, but also, um, and even more so, by the um, the combination of very large labor shortages in the health and social care sector with the government's decision to make the visa requirements for people coming in those sectors, as I said before, considerably more liberal than even the system on paper would have uh, would have would have, you know would would have given without those special visas for people coming in in health and care, um, and. Uh, uh, um, you know, what happened in health and care, of course, was a sort of combination of the after impact of the pandemic um, uh, and the uh, squee, you know, the, the sort of what many people in the existing workforce perceive as an intensifying squeeze on pay and conditions um, and, a, you know, a, um, and in some cases burnout resulting from those pressures and from the after the pandemic, meaning that people are leaving health and social care at a greater rate, in turn intensified right after the pandemic by quite rapid growth in nominal wages in other sectors. So you did see a lot of people, I think, particularly in social care, saying, well, why would I do a difficult 
um, you know, quite demanding and stressful job for 10 or 11 pounds an hour when I could do a perhaps boring but uh, um, somewhat less stressful and somewhat better paid job in a supermarket or an Amazon center or whatever for 12 or 13 or 14 pounds an hour. Um, um, and so you've seen uh, um, people in those sectors leaving and, and, and the, hence generating the demand for this new visa that I described, the care visa. And similarly in, in, uh, um, in the National Health Service as well, where the pay is not quite so low, but again, the pressures of burnout and pressure on 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 you know pay uh, on conditions has been uh, been quite intense um but um and this is the really important point which i think people um, um often fail to recognize is that the work visa story is not the whole story by a long way because so look at that figure those figures you can see from that graph that there were maybe uh, uh, um, the, the work visas um, in the last couple of years um, amounted to perhaps, you know, and this includes actually people, the spouses and dependents of people who come on work visas. That's the way the, uh, uh, the, the Home Office produced the figures. So if you look at actually the number of work visas issued, it only comes to maybe 400 uh, 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 over the last couple of years, it only comes to four to 500,000 actual work visas issued to people coming to a particular job. But what's happened to the number of um, recent migrants working in the UK? Well, this graph is a really, really dramatic one. Um, this shows payroll employments, which is a concept I don't have time to explain, but it's basically, you know, uh, um, your employer, if you are employed, as opposed to being self-employed, your employer has to submit a form, obviously, to, to HMRC uh, with your national insurance number on it. So the HMRC knows every month uh, uh, um, how many people are, are employed, how many employments there are, to be precise, rather than employees. Um, and they also know, because of the, the national insurance number, whether or not um, you were uh, um, you got your national insurance number because you were born here or because you acquired it later um, moving here as an adult. Um, and so we can see this green line, uh, which is a number of people um, who uh, registered for their national insurance number when they arrived here, as opposed to by virtue of being here um, as a kid, uh, um, has, which again, grew slowly but steadily in the run up to the pandemic, has really taken off since then. And that number has risen by 1.3 million um, since um, really over the last three years. So 1.3 million extra payroll employments for, for people from outside Europe, uh, uh, from whose origin was originally from outside Europe. Far more than can be simply explained by the number of work visas issued. And as I say, this is something that people often miss. It's not just about work visas. Um, and we can also see that if we look at the sectoral split, I won't try and explain this chart, it's explained in my paper, but it's sort of an illustration of the extra numbers who are working in various sectors um, by origin um, and, and how they are to some, in some sense uh, replacing uh, the shortfall in EU workers that's resulted from, from that fall. And you can see, yes, there are loads more people working in, in health and social care from outside the EU, the biggest single sector, and that is work visas. But we can also see that there are big numbers working in administrative and support service activities and in accommodation and food service. And those are not sectors in which typically you can apply for a visa. Sure, you can if you're a, you know, an experienced sushi chef. You can get a visa for that. It's skilled and it pays well. But the vast majority of the people shown here in the orange bar are not experienced sushi chef. There are people working in bars and restaurants, and they are filling the gap left by those Europeans who aren't coming anymore. Um, and those people are not getting visas to do those jobs. What they are doing is coming here as students or as dependents of people coming on work visas, or people who are dependents of people coming on student visas, or they're people on graduate visas who are staying on. In other words, they're coming through other bits of the visa system, and they're filling the gaps in the labor market left by 
the Europeans who are not there. And um, they are, you know, and, and this is really quite significant in the, in the uh, picture of the overall labor market. And, you know, if you did, the, uh, oh, I've got somewhere the, the chart here for, your, for, for UK born people, and that is flat and for indeed in the last year or so falling. The number of Brits in work is falling rather than rising. So all the job growth we've seen since the pandemic has been driven by people from outside Europe. Um, they've replaced the, you know, they're, 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 they're filling the gaps left by uh, um, Europeans. And they are also offsetting the fall in employment that's resulted from the rise in inactivity that, that as we know, has, has, has followed the pandemic. Um, I won't say that they're filling the gaps there because I suspect that for the most part, they were doing rather different jobs. Uh, you know, you wouldn't expect the people who are dropping out of the labor force for because of sickness and disability necessarily to be working in bars and restaurants, although there may, of course, be, be some of that. Um, so that's the first part. Well, what about um, wages? One thing um, that you may, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of complaints uh, about low skilled immigration, a lot of complaints indeed that people who are coming in, particularly in care, are doing very low paid jobs. Um, and there is um, a certain amount of truth in that. But does that mean that overall, um, that, uh, um, uh, that, that, that workers from outside the EU uh, um, or indeed from the EU are, you know, just doing the low paid, low skilled jobs. Well, this also comes from the same data set, which also tells us about pay. Um, and here we can see this is for, so this looks at people who are here already because we need that as a sort of baseline. And here we can see that actually um, non-Europeans started off. If you look at pe only people who were already working in 2014, the pay, everybody's seen their pay progress quite a bit. Non-Europeans have seen it or progress rather faster than people from the UK. So that's the sort of basic data point that actually migrants in the UK labor market on average do quite well. Um, but um, this um, one looks at averages. And so here you see that on average, people, uh, uh, um, sorry, let me just uh, check what the, exactly this like. Um, th this looks at uh, um, uh, what about new migrants? So, and it compares them to the overall workforce. So just to be absolutely clear what I'm showing here, this is average earnings in the workforce as a whole. This is new people who've just shown up, basically, um, uh, um, from both outside the EU and from inside the EU. And as you would expect, they start off at a slight, at, at something of a disadvantage in terms of earnings compared to the average, which, you know, just as, you know, if you put a, a new entrant to the workforce who was British, they come in way lower on this as it happens because they typically just be leaving school or university. But what you see here is that there is this disadvantage. But interestingly, that gap erodes over time quite a bit. So new entrants to the workforce in 2022 from outside the EU were doing almost as well as the average. They had relatively little earnings disadvantages at all. So you see actually rather than the sort of earnings disadvantage of new migrants growing, it's actually shrinking quite rapidly for people from outside the EU. And the uh, um, following slide shows that even more strongly. So this shows this by year of entry. So you see somebody who, in, who entered it, got here in 2015, would have caught up with the average by um, about six to seven years in by 2021. Somebody who got here in 2020 um, caught up within a year. Um, so we might have thought that there would be this sort of deterioration in the relative earnings of new migrants because there were just more of them and many more of them, a lot of them seem to be doing relatively low skilled or low pay jobs. That doesn't seem to be the case in the data. It's early days yet. But some of the stories that you see about how there's all these people coming and doing the to do very low paid jobs. Well, some of that is clearly true. But in aggregate, it doesn't really seem to be the case. 
uh, um, at least in the data that we've seen so far. Um, and um, finally, um, an even more interesting question is, well, what does all this do to productivity? Uh, you know, the productivity in the economy as a whole. Here, the evidence is much, much more tentative because the you know data is is very ropey, um, and it's much more harder to establish causality. But what the sort of preliminary look at it says shows that there is perhaps a slight correlation, negative correlation between EU migration and productivity. That is to say, sectors and regions that show higher levels of migration within the EU show slightly lower levels of productivity growth. But for non-EU migrants, it's the opposite. There seems to be some slight positive correlation between sectors and productivity growth. Um, driven, it has to be said, mostly by ICT, where we know there's a high presence of, of, of migrants uh, from outside the EU, especially India, and productivity growth tends to be fast. So you will have to be very careful of drawing any inference of this. But again, the idea that migration is somehow dragging down productivity overall, um, and this new, level, new, new migration will decrease productivity, seems to have very little or no support in the data so far as we know. Um, so what can we conclude? Um, well, first and most obviously, that there has been this very sh sharp shift in size and competition of Im immigration flows to the UK. That's just a fact. Um, and it's clear also from that that a large proportion of people who have not come here notionally on work visas are nonetheless working. Um, we have some evidence actually of improved earnings and certainly not deteriorating earnings among non-European migrants and some perhaps suggestive evidence of a positive association between that and productivity. So all that is a pretty positive story. Um, um, there are clearly negatives, which I haven't discussed yet, and I think particularly in the social care sector, um, there is still uh, um, a big question as to whether it is actually sensible for us to be paying people quite so little and treating them so badly that the only people we can persuade to do these jobs are people coming from other countries. Um, the answer to that, in my view, is not really about migration policy. It's about policy towards the social care sector, uh, um, which is clearly um, far from, from optimal. Um, but nonetheless, I think overall, actually, the, the, the balance sheet is pretty positive. Um, certainly without, I think uh, you, you can fairly strongly conclude that without this uh, um, uh, shoring up by this rapid entry of, of new migrants to the workforce that our GDP and uh, fiscal position would be even worse than it already is, and we'd be in an even bigger hole. Um, what next? Um, well, as you know, um, the government's made a number of changes because it's decided that migration is too high uh, um, for various reasons. How? What impact will this have? Um, it will impact certain sectors, in particular the hospitality sector, for the set, set reasons I mentioned. But you know, because uh, 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 um, it will choke off some of this uh, uh, growth in dependents who have arguably been filling some of the gaps in that sector. It may affect some other sectors where, which we care about, where the new thresholds will be too high for people to come in and uh, you know at junior levels. So tech startups, for example, have been complaining very bitterly. I would say the overall macroeconomic impact is limited. Um, there may well be a uh, interaction with, with policy on, on universities where universities are clearly seeing a significant fall in the number of international students and that will affect our ability to, um, to provide courses um, for British students as well, as well as to do research. So there is some, there are some serious risks there in my view and, and uh, a big policy car crash down the line. On care, as I've said, there is a policy impasse where the government says it want wants to reduce migration, but at the same time it is by its policy on underfunding social care, effectively the biggest single contributor to the demand for migration and is unwilling to choke that off. Um, so that is uh, uh, just a policy impasse or contradiction, which some government at some point is going to have to, 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 to resolve, but uh, it's been a while and there's no sign of it yet.
Um, and finally, I think there is a sort of general question about migrate policy stability in the migration field, where we sort of yo-yo around from from more liberal to more uh, um, restrictive stances in a way which I don't think is particularly helpful to uh, bus either businesses or the UK's image abroad. But nonetheless, uh, um, I'm still a relative optimist about both migration to the UK and UK policy. I think that the pressures are such that uh, the economic pressures are such that despite their worst instincts, and believe me, politicians do have some pretty bad instincts on this, um, governments are nonetheless under pressure to, to maintain their modicum of sanity. And, and we will see, uh, um, I expect, uh, uh, relatively high levels of migration for the foreseeable future, which on the whole is one bright spot in an otherwise relatively gloomy, gloomy picture for the UK economy. Um, so uh, I've covered quite a lot there um, in, in half an hour, but uh, um, hopefully that uh, um, gives you uh, um, some idea of, of my perspective and uh, I look forward to questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that insightful analysis. It's really, really interesting to pour through that data and those charts and, and question some of the, the things we might have believed and yeah. Really insightful. Thank you very much. Um, so if anybody does have any questions, please do start to type those into the chat section. I'll be able to deliver those to Jonathan. Um, I will get started with one of mine while we're waiting for some of those to come in. Um, so I, I did have a, a read through some of the papers that you've written on this topic um, and found that very interesting. And one thing that I wanted to pick up on was a point that you've made about the kind of the post-Brexit immigration system being somewhat at odds with the government's broader economic agenda. Um, and I just wondered if you could, and this, what I mean by that, if the people that aren't um, aware of that is specifically with regards to levelling up in technology and, and net zero, I believe it was. Um, would you mind elaborating a little bit on those points? Yes, although to be fair, I wrote that when levelling up was still a policy. <laughs> and of course, it's not in any meaningful sense of policy at the moment maybe it will be you know I, and in some sense i think that that's actually a sort of it, that was an interesting question at the time it's sort of not an interesting question for this government because they don't have a policy on leveling up or indeed much of a broader industrial or net zero policy at all but it is i think an interesting question for the next government especially if it's a labor government right because if you have a labor government um which you know, has missions, you know, that and, and the talk is of a mission-driven government. So there are missions like um, net zero uh, um, and building lots more, right? So if you have a policy that uh, um, essentially prioritizes people on the basis, basis of um, skill level and salary, well, who does that prioritize? You know, it prioritizes people in relatively high paid, jobs, especially, frankly, people working for large companies in London. So, you know, uh, um, banks, financial services in general, but also our other, you know, uh, um, big uh, um, high productivity, high paid service sectors like law, accountancy, consultancy, et cetera, et cetera, um, especially London centric ones, you know, even, even after the salary threshold rise, 37,000 pounds, is not a huge salary for London. There are lots of uh, companies that have loads and loads of jobs in, in that category. Um, so by having these sort of neutral objective um, metrics for who you, who you want and who you implicitly don't want, you're favoring those companies and those sectors. But if you don't want to be neutral and objective about your, uh, your, your uh, um, economic policy more generally and your industrial strategy, and clearly you don't if your priority is things something like net zero, then why are you why are you doing so for your immigration policy? If actually your priority is net zero, why are you saying that um, a bank can employ, you know, a relatively junior regulation specialist to do a job on 45,000 pounds a year, but a wind turbine manufacturer can't employ a skilled engineer 
on, you know, or, or mid-skilled engineer on 35,000 bands a year in Grimsby. I'm making these numbers up, but you, you see the point. Why aren't you, pri or if you're going to build um, lots more infrastructure in parts of the country that are currently underserved, again, you're going to need a lot of people. Not all of them will be paid over 38,000 pounds a year. So, you know, are you going to try and join up these two strategies and if so how um you know and i'm in two minds about this because on on the one hand you know i think that there is something of a contradiction here on the other hand uh, um i also think that you know there's a limit to government you know it's government planning is uh, um you know, uh, you know the, the government does have to plan i'm not a pure libertarian by any means or believe that the market will sort everything out but i'm pretty skeptical of joining up labor market planning with industrial policy it seems to be a recipe for at best slowing down both of those things rather than getting on with doing stuff we need to be done but i think you know i think labor are, are somewhat torn on this frankly uh, um and it'll be very interesting to see how that how what sort of their, their priorities are right, thank you and and on that point is do you have any uh, suggestions or thoughts on the direction of immigration policy um, if a new Labour government did, did, did come in? Um, well, I mean, what Labour have said is that they want to link skills policy and immigration policy, that the, you know, the, the way to get down immigration is to, uh, uh, to have you know, better skills policy so we train up our own people. Um, and that's not completely crazy. But it's more of a soundbite than a policy, right? Um, and in particular, it's not going to solve you know a, a social care without, at the same time, quite a large injection of taxpayer cash. Because you can improve training and conditions on social care a bit, but actually, you need to pay people more than the minimum wage plus fifty p, which is sort of what we do now. If you really want people to to change bedpans and and and. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, help people with Alzheimer's, which is what we're asking people in care homes to do. Yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, um, and there's no sign whatsoever at the moment that Labour is going to commit the sort of money that would be required to do that. Um, then in other sectors, where there's high demand for immigration, I'm much less persuaded, you know, skills and training, you know, it, it's not, again, obvious necessarily in high demand sectors we probably need both better training and skills and higher immigration as well at the same and immigration as well at the same time um so it's not obvious to me that that you know while more more and better skills training is undoubtedly um something the uk economy really really needs it's not uh, uh, obvious to me that joining it up with immigration policy uh, is necessarily going to make either that much better. So uh, what I have said to Labour is and going you know, in my last point about policy stability, you know, I think there are gains to be made just by saying actually to employers and to the rest of the world, actually the system in many respects works reasonably well now. We're not going to make any sort of radical politically driven changes to it in the immediate future, as opposed to just trying to make it work better and more efficiently around the edges. Okay. I guess there's the question similarly related to that um, from the audience is will Labour's employment rights from day one impact on immigration in your, in your view? Um, I'm not sure that it will. Um, I mean, at the moment, migrants have broadly the same employment rights as as the rest of us anyway so they acquire them after the same period um i mean there clearly are problems in some parts of the labor market again in the care sector but that's not the only sector with um exploitation um but that's much less about the people's legal employment rights than about you know it's much less about expanding people's legal employment rights than in, about enforcing the rights that they already have so um, you know the you and, and and which is sort of my view on labor's employment rights agenda in general frankly which is that you know do I think employment rights from day one is a good idea I'm not sure uh I'm not convinced on the other hand I don't think it will be that sort of disaster that some right-wing uh, you know economists are claiming what I do think though is that 
enforcing the employment rights that already exist would make considerably more difference um, to low paid workers, migrant or otherwise, um, than actually expanding um, those rights. And do you think the policy will have any tangible impact on the, the absolute figures in terms of immigration? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll take these two questions together. Um, one says, is there data on the number of immigrants per country and the biggest net growth or decrease coming in and leaving the UK since Brexit? And um, at the start of your slides, you touched on the idea that immigration will start to fall back in the coming years. Um, what is it that's that's going to cause this? Um, so, uh, um the uh, um on on the 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 first one um where do migrants come from so the huge the biggest growth has been by far among indians um and then nigerians so the number of uh uh you know within that non eu workforce data i showed the number of indians has has almost doubled um from more than double sorry from a bit over 400,000 to a bit over, to well over 850,000 um the number of nigerians has almost tripled from a somewhat lower base um from a bit over 100,000 to somewhere between 350,000 or so um and that's driven because uh, um the you know the reason for indians being such a large component is because you see them in all the categories there are indians coming in to do skilled work indians are by far the largest number who come in to do work in ict or financial services um you see them in the nhs doctors and nurses you also see them in the care sector and you see them as students um nigerians um also lots of nigerian students and quite a lot of nigerian care workers um, then you have other groups like Filipino nurses and Zimbabwean carers and so on. Um, but um, Indians and Nigerians are, are, are clearly the, the, the really big uh, um, growth countries. Um, second question, why are the numbers going to fall back? Partly policy and partly mechanical. Some of it is sort of mechanical. Um, you know, part of the boost was Ukrainians and Hong Kong. So that was just mostly a one off. Um, Partly, um, it's because when student numbers increase, you get um, obviously most, not all, um, but most, even taking account of the graduate visa, most students leave in the, eventually. And so obviously, if you increase the number of students, that first increases the number coming in, but later down the line, increases the number going out as well. So you get a sort of uh, a mechanical rebound effect. And then the policy changes will also have some restrictive impact, in particular, the changes on dependents, which will reduce the number of dependents coming in uh, um, through the... Uh, um, uh, the the student and the the care worker route. Um, so that so there will be some reduction where it will sort of settle, if that's even a meaningful term. They may just keep on bouncing around, is, is anyone's guess. But the 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 most uh, um, sort of serious modelling on this done by my colleagues at the Migration Observatory suggests that you might expect it to settle down to two hundred fifty or three hundred thousand or so. But that really is very much, a, you know, that is subject to both uncertainty in terms of the modelling and uncertainty in terms of what future policy looks like. And of course, uncertainty is what happens to the, the wider economy. Okay. Um, and touching upon the changes in dependency status for international students, and um, we've got another question here asking if it's possible that that will put a huge strain on British universities, um, potentially forcing them to eventually raise tuition fees again. Um, and this person says when graduates are already facing a cost of living crisis and sorority house prices? Um, well, I think the short answer is, is it possible or put a huge stain? It's more than possible, it's probable, or indeed are arguably happening now to some universities. Uh, um, you know, there has been a wave of redundancy notices in uni UK universities over the last couple of months, driven by a, a fall in the number of international students coming. Um, so this is happening already. Um, but we don't get to raise tuition fees, right? The government sets tuition fees. We would raise them for British students if we could. Not me personally. I'm not <laughs> that. Not, didn't make it, but our vice chancellor certainly would. Um, but that's not in their gift. 
um, you know, the government faces a choice, which is that it can either, um, you know, then, and, you know, in the short term, I mean, you know, ideally, of course, everybody would just be much more efficient and better and everything would be okay. But, you know, in the short term, the, the sort of most three obvious choices are either the government raises tuition fees, um, the tuition fees were allowed to charge Brits, which, as the questioner says, would hit graduates who are already facing significant financial strains, or um, the government um, uh, encourages us to recruit more international students and liberalizes the rules again a bit, or at least makes some positive changes that allow us to recruit more. Um, but that will right push put upward rather than downward pressure on migration numbers, which again has political implications. Um, or the government lets university, some universities go bust and others make big cutbacks, which will reduce opportunities for British students. Um, the problem, of course, is that none of these is particularly attractive politically. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what will happen, but it's a pretty nasty sort of trilemma um, for any government to be in. And it's one this government seems to have every intention of leaving to its successor. Uh, frankly, um, so you have to add this to you know the the quite already quite long list of um, unpleasant surprises left behind, or not surprises because we know about this, but unpleasant um, unexploded bombs left behind by this government for its uh, for its successor. I'm afraid. So I I don't know what they will do, but but this is a ser very serious problem. Yeah, and, and I guess just on that point, if some future government was happy to allow um, the number of international students coming in and thereby um, immigration numbers to rise in order to essentially fund um, university places for UK students. Do you see that as a kind of viable long term idea in, within the university sector? Um, I'm, I mean, I think it is in the sense that, you know, uh, um, if you go to India and say, so, you know, you know the, the, or, or Nigeria, you know, um, on, you know, the, the demographics there, unlike most of the rest of the world, are quite different. Um, you know, you've got economies that are expanding quite rapidly and hence educating lots more young people quite quickly um, and um, still growing populations. So the, you know, the Indian middle class, the number of, of qualified Indian high school graduates is not shrinking and will not shrink, you know, so yes, we are competing with a bunch of other countries for those graduates, for, for those high school graduates. But if, if our offer is perceived to be good, then I think those numbers continue to increase. And while there are certainly concerns about quality and standards in some courses at some universities, and, you know, no doubt there's also some abuse of the system, both by some universities and by some students, um, you know, uh, um, I don't think that changes the big picture that that most people who come here are qualified and get a, a decent experience out of it. And as long as we can continue to deliver that, um, we, we you know, obviously you don't want to continue expanding indefinitely. You don't want that cross substitute to be too big. So my personal view is, is that we do need to put up tuition fees, uh, albeit partly offset by considerably more generous support for lower income students and graduates, uh, 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 um, you, know, you know, more in the way of bursaries in particular and loan relief for new graduates. Uh, um, but uh, 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 um, I still think we, we, would, we, we should be trying to increase tuition fees somewhat and or putting more somewhat more government money into it. But uh, um, but I don't think but I think, you know, international students should be part of the strategy very much there. Okay. Um, another, another question here from an audience member. Um, many people argue that Britain is full. Um, what is Britain's population density in comparison to other countries? Um, well, I mean, it's clearly not full in the sense of, you know, the number, the proportion of the UK land that is occupied by houses or even land contiguous to houses is three to five percent or whatever huge areas of the country that are not built on at all. Lots of, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, our den and, and, you know, population density, um, you know, it were comparable to the Netherlands, for example, were higher than most other countries in Europe. Um, 
but actually London isn't particularly dense, right? Um, lots of cities in Europe have uh, substantial areas of which are much denser than anywhere in London, Barcelona or whatever, um, because of the way we choose to build houses. So it's all, much of this is about choices, about how many houses we build and where, where we build them. Um, so I've never really bought the, the Britain is, uh, um, is, is full argument. There clearly are issues to do with both with housing and with the infrastructure that you need to support housing, uh, um, uh, water services, transport services, water and sewerage services, and so on. Um, but I don't really go for the uh, um, for the Britain is full or London is full uh, line line myself. Um, and another one here, um, I think you briefly touched upon some of these ideas, um, but what sectors of the economy um, are the migrants mainly and significantly contributing to? Um, so, I mean, I think at the moment, you know, the recent migration, the, the biggest by far is, is health and social care, where, you know, the NHS in, in, and, and care system, which are not doing well anyway, would have fallen over completely because they have just seen such a large outflow of staff from uh, uh, um, staff turnover uh, um, in, in, in recent years um, because of burnout, pay and conditions and so on. Um, beyond that, um, uh, as I said, I mean, you know, the, the, the tech sector um, is quite dependent on, on migrants. Um, and then, um, as I said, the sort of in some areas of the country, um, accommodation and food, the accommodation, food, sort of tourism related sectors have, have relied on, on migrants to fill the, the gaps, as it were, that were left by departing or uh, Europeans or Europeans who, who are not, not coming anywhere. So those are the big sectors in there. Of course, you know, there, there are lots of, you know, I mean, my, the university, my own sector, the university sector, of course, as well as having lots of international students, a huge proportion of our workforce is from abroad. Most, you know, the majority of my colleagues in, in my department are, 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 are migrants. Um, so we couldn't teach our students British or foreign without uh, um, being able to recruit migrants as well. Okay. And I guess the kind of flip side, um, from another question here, um, there are a number of sectors that have a serious sort of shortage of skilled workers, for example, construction workers, where the, um, the, the wages might not necessarily meet the, the thresholds. Um, how does the current immigration policy meet those needs? Well, I mean, I think construction is a difficult one, and I think construction is one that's clearly suffered. And the reason there is because of the, I my view has a lot to do with the sort of the, the the business model of the construction sector more generally. Was that you know when when uh, you know and, uh, under free movement, people could just come work, you know you 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 know uh, um, uh, uh, come and go and work as they please on the same basis as a British worker. Um, Lots of construction workers could get visas in theory, but that's not really the way the sector works, the way it does, say, in you know, universities or banks, because constructors, you have contractors, you have subcontractors, you have sub-subcontractors and sub-subcontractors, you have a lot of self-employed people. And so um, you can't get a visa really as a self-employed construction worker, and most subcontractors aren't going to do it either. So it doesn't quite work the same way. So I think that that, that is a sector where where there have been significant problems as a result of the change, um, and and one where you might want to think about whether you need to to sort of retune the system in such a way as to to meet those needs. Um, that I, I'm less. Uh, that that may also apply to things like low carbon heating systems and so on as, as well. Thanks. Um, and I remember earlier in the um, in the discussion, you, can, you described our system here in the UK as as liberal, essentially, compared to others. Would you mind just elaborating on some of the characteristics of some other systems and comparing them to us? Well, I mean, if you look at the US, for example, it's very, very hard to get a visa as a skilled worker. Um, it's a lottery, both literal lottery in, uh, to, to some extent, because there's a limited number of visas and also a lottery in whether your application is accepted or denied in the first place. Um, so uh, um, uh, the US is particularly unfavorable. Um, or, or sort of arbitrary, 
And, you know, there's lotteries for green cards, lotteries for, for uh, um, you get H1B diseases, but there's a cap, quite a strict cap. And so the, it's filled up on the first day that applications are open or so on. Um, so in practice, most skilled immigrants to the U.S. end up tend to be people who've gone there to study and end up staying on one way or the other. But even that's a bit, you know, uh, uh, um, opaque at best. Um, in many, you know, so European countries, all the systems differ, you know, so the Italy now has what looks on paper like a relatively liberal law, but when, you know, but being Italy, it's far from clear it's actually that liberal in practice because of the way that the, bureaucracy works both in principle and uh, in practice. Um, the Dutch have a somewhat more liberal law, uh, 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 you know, have, have a more liberal system. The Germans uh, um, have tried to liberalize their system in recent years. They had a number of false starts, but seem to be making somewhat more growth. So other countries in Europe face the same sort of issues and challenges we do, but I think we're probably, we've probably done better than anyone else in Europe. Um, at coming up with a system which you know is reasonably clear, easy to understand. You can look at the job and the salary and know whether or not you're eligible. And if you're eligible, unless you do something really stupid or there's something really odd about you, you should be able to get the visa. Mm -hmm. um, and we compare well in that respect. Um, so as I say, on the whole, I think we we still measure up quite well. Um, and I guess the final question probably. Um, you mentioned before as well that the um, non-EU workers have essentially been filling the gaps of left by the EU workers, but probably not filling the gaps that are left through the high inactivity of, of UK workers. Um, how do you think this plays out then, I guess? How do you, what will we need to, to fill that, that gap in, 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 in the inactivity of UK workers? Well, that's a very good question, uh, um, and and uh, um, you know there there are a whole area of policy. Unfortunately, um, I think you know, a lot of what we do is to need in, in these is about improving the way the health system functions and the way the health system functions in conjunction with the employment system and Job Centre Plus, um, and again that needs both considerably better management. Um, and uh, probably some new resources. Um, and I mean, I do think it is something a, a government could do, but it requires a degree of patience and it, it will take time. Um, and in particular, you know, we need to get away from this, from, from the sort of knee jerk punitive approach to people who go off work for, for, you know, and claim benefit from sickness and disability, which we tried in the early 2010s and didn't work at all. And we seem to be planning to try again now, and I doubt will work any better than it, it did then. Um, and more generally, of course, a lot of this is about mental health, and 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 it's uh, um, again an area of the health service which has been under resourced and and not terribly well managed. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, as it's just now hit eight o'clock, we'll we'll leave things there. Um, I want to say a big thank you, Jonathan, for taking the time this evening uh, to deliver that talk. It's been incredibly insightful. I've certainly learned a lot and I found it incredibly interesting as well. Um, and to everybody that has joined as well, a big thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and I'll leave things there. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan.